Can you talk about dying before you die and the effect that has on the organism of the human being? Um, and what, if anything, is left? I don't think I'm qualified to respond to that question, Cassie. You said dying before you die. You know when married people, you know, they meet and they're attracted to each other. And after, I don't know, six months, two years, three years, they decide to get married. And there is lots of hopes and fantasies and dreams, you know, that they both have. They're going to have a big ceremony, you know, by the ocean and the church. They're going to buy a house, you know, buy a couple of cars. Teslas, hopefully. You know, hopefully they'll have kids. See them go to school, go to college, get married, become grandkids, and grandparents. So all relationships begin that way. That there is something out there and for some strange reason, you find yourself attracted to it. And that attraction creates a relationship. It could be a passing thing. You could invest in it. And the more you invest in the relationship, uh, the more it has the power to create an identity for you. You know, you become a mother, you become a wife, you become a professor, you become a daughter. These are all kind of labels or titles that we give ourselves because of the longevity of the relationship. Then you know the politics of life, which is, you look at your husband or you look at your wife, and this is after like 10, 15, 20 years, you've had your children, you know, they're now in high school, And, you know, it's like being in a ring with Mike Tyson. You just keep getting beat up, you know. And you're always, after a while, you're in damage control, you know. Uh, you wake up at six, tend to the kids, see them off to school, you come home, you go to work, you come home and, you know, you're just busy running around, making sure that you know, you're kind of taking care of the basic stuff of life. And in the midst of taking care of the basics of life, you lose something of yourself. You lose the time that you could perhaps sit and maybe dance, or sit and write, sit and reflect on things, go out to the forest somewhere, go for a walk, go to the ocean and just kind of 
think about things a little. You lose all that because you're just entangled in life. Now, nobody tells you any of this. Nobody sits you and educates you as to what happens to you when you get into a relationship, any relationship. You know, you don't watch porn in hopes of becoming addicted. You don't play video games, you know, in hopes of becoming addicted. You don't go into seclusion in hopes that you lose your social skills. These are just happen to you and no one really tells you that if you do this particular thing day after day after day, the consequences are that you'll just become an animal, uncivilized. And no one wants to be around you and even if they want to, they wouldn't know what to do with you because there's just so many things wrong with you. And so, you know, one day as a the man or the woman, they walk home after 15, 20 years of being in this relationship. And, you know, it's kind of like Will Smith at the Oscars. You just kind of crack you know something about you just gets demolished under this pressure and something another part of you just opens up and you say I just can't do this anymore in the morning things were fine you know we had nice breakfast with your wife or your husband your children And after 20 years of kind of just pushing down the emotions day after day after day, it's not that it's all been bad, it's been pretty good, but depending on what kind of a person you've been and what things you have lost, you know. And the more intimate your relationship has been with something, let's say with writing, with thinking, with dancing, with teaching, it doesn't really matter. The more intimate you have been with that particular aspect of yourself and the way it expressed itself and you enjoyed the world the way it expressed itself, the harder it's going to be when you witness it slowly just eroding. You know. But if you come from a culture that kind of reinforces certain social etiquettes the idea of you all of a sudden going nuts it's not going to happen that easily the idea of you walking away from a marriage is not going to happen the idea of you physically abusing your wife or your husband or your children that's going to take a long long time hopefully never but if it does happen it'll take a long time for that to kind of consume you uh, And then you walk home and you say, I can't do this anymore. But again, you put the lid on. You go home and you look at your husband and your wife. You feel absolutely nothing. It may even be in the negative. You know. The kids come home and you feel nothing for them either. I mean, after a while, you come to, come to realize that everybody eventually does their own thing, you know. The husband is over there, the wife is over there, the kids are over there, your parents are getting old, they have to kind of do the best they can on their own. What can you do for them? No one does anything for you and you can't really do much for them. I mean, I'm not talking about once in a while you visiting your mom and putting a band-aid or someone visiting you and putting a band-aid on your stuff. You kind of know the function of this band-aid and you've kind of grown tired of it. Everybody playing nice and you playing nice. But tradition comes in, you know, where it says, don't think like that, don't feel like that. You know, don't be the first one in your family divorcing. Don't be the first one in your family walking away from the children. Stay in it, you know. 
And then the stronger the tradition, the more they're going to kind of make you feel bad about the way you think, about the way you feel, about yourself within the context of your relationship with people, you know. Depending on your capacity, depending on the amount of pressure put on you by life, by your own awareness of your position in life, the more you're aware, and the more you reflect, and the more you feel, there's a great chance that something about you is just going to crack open, and you're going to go home and you say, I'm done. And you realize that the oath that you took in the church, you know, only death will part us. You realize it's no longer a need for a physical death for you to walk away from a relationship. Emotionally, you feel nothing about your family life. You feel nothing about your wife or your husband. You feel really nothing about your parents and what they may think of you should you take action on how you're feeling at this stage in your life, which is, I can't be in it anymore. You don't much care about your kids. You know, um, you say, well, everybody have to kind of take care of themselves in this world and everybody's to some extent abandoned. You know, the best I can with the kids, but I'm just suffocating. This is just not working out for me. And you have, let's just say, a, a religious tradition as well, that you can divorce, but only under dire circumstances. But by the time you get to the snow feeling stage, you don't really care whether God exists or not. You don't really care if you're damned. Um, or not, whether you're going to be forgiven. None of those things matter. All you know is that you just can no longer do it. And there is going to be a huge, I think, internal conflict. And as you think about it and feel about it more, uh, this is stuff that's boiling inside you. You know, eventually there'll come a point where it'll just erupt. Now, if you're lucky enough to find distractions in life, you know, and, you know, distractions come in all sorts of different ways. If you can manage reading a book and not thinking about your relationship, if you can go to a park with your companion and your kids and your friends perhaps and not to think about it, if you're able to constantly put a band-aid, you know, on the stuff you feel, and this band-aid distracts you enough, where you no longer think and feel and reflect, then you'll be fine. But the problem with reflection is that it forces you to be very, very, very honest. You know, it doesn't mean that you will lose the ability to self-deceive and deceive the other person. But you'll, as time goes on, you'll find it to be more and more difficult. You know? And then, you know, you take your family to the restaurant and you guys are having a good time. He or she doesn't know what's inside you, what's taking place. And, uh, you're really trying to kind of be an extrovert, get out of yourself, go out there and be with the kids, be with the wife or the husband, be with the you know, in-laws and your own parents as everybody is just talking about politics and religion, having a good time. And all of a sudden you snap and you say, I just can't do this. And your husband, your wife says, can't do what? Is the food bad? says, yeah, you're bad. You know, every time I look at you, I, it's like I'm drinking poison. You know, uh, you know, everyday part of me just begins to die. And I hate that. I feel nothing. Um, it's a very sad place to be. Uh, and it usually takes a long time to get there. 
you know, and then you go home. And your companion says, okay, I'll, I'll see you home. I'll bring the kids, don't worry, go rest. And you go home and uh, you begin to look for your suitcases. You go into the attic and grab a few and, you know, put your stuff in there and you put them in the trunk of the car and uh, you leave a note. Sorry. And you leave. You know, if you have watched the movie Freedom Riders, you know, uh, it's a high school, it's, it's a, in a rough place, you know, and most of these kids who come from a very, very kind of impoverished background, you know, nobody cares for them, nobody gets them books, everybody is afraid of them, uh, they've kind of been abandoned by their own parents, by society, by God. So this woman comes in and, you know, for whatever the reasons are, uh, maybe she's young and hopeful, I don't know, but she inspires all these kids. The problem with inspiring children or, you know, young adults is that it's addictive. You like when you see change happening in front of you. You know, when someone, instead of saying y'all, they say you all. You know, someone who says hey, all of a sudden says hello. You know, someone who cracks nasty jokes, all of a sudden is a bit more contained and, you know, speaks more eloquently. And the husband comes to realize that she has found her niche in life. You know, she's spending more and more time taking care of these kids and less and less time being home. And in the scene, he kind of looks at her and says, I didn't sign up for this. You know, and his suitcases are just all packed and that's the last you see of him. He kind of leaves. But if, you know, we were to go back to, and, and the movie does really a poor job as most movies do is because they're only an hour and a half or two hours long. Uh, or a person who's kind of just walking away from their family life. We have no idea what happens to them when they go into, once they go into their psychological cave, you know, because like any other desire, you have no idea where this desire is going to take you. It's very tempting because what happens in all desires is that you have a great amount of fantasy and imagination. You know, you think that the choice that you're making is going to lead you to this palace of fine arts, so to speak. You know, that you're going to kind of figure out who you are, what you are, you're going to have a relatively creative life. I mean, that is what imagination does, you know. You don't imagine, like, walking away from your parents or your companion and then, you know, ending your life. I mean, it's not like the death of a salesman scenario where you realize your life has no value to your family but your death gives them half a million dollars. I mean, that's a good death. You do it for your family. It's kind of like, Jesus, you know, his death kind of has a tendency of saving us, so to speak, if you believe in that particular metaphor. You know, you realize all of a sudden as you walk away and you get yourself a studio, you know, when you saw your husband and your wife, when you saw your children, they would remind you how pathetic and how meaningless your life has become, how valueless. But now that there is no one to reflect back to you who you are, what you've been, you kind of sit back and you say, okay, well, my wife is no longer, or my husband is no longer here to make me feel bad about who I've become. My kids are no longer here. Now that I turn off the lights, now when I go home and there's nobody there, well, what am I doing here? 
So there's a great amount of conflict that all of a sudden takes place. Initially, it takes place because you just don't like your life. And then you want to change because what you're talking about really is change, you know. And dying before you're dead, there are all these different stages you have to go through. I mean, you have to understand, Cassie, it's one thing to say as a statement that you should die before you're dead. It's a great statement, you know. It's no different than what you find in the Gospels. You know, what benefit is there for someone to gain the whole world but lose his soul? You know, why not just, you know, die to the world so you can gain your soul? I mean, that's what it is. The difficulty with that, I mean, if you kind of go back to some of the things we've talked about, you know, the few of us that, who have gathered you know, on Thursdays. You know, you can't dismiss the power of your physical body and the way it interacts with the physical world and the relationships that it creates. They are powerful. And they give you meaning, they give you identity, they give you purpose, they give you hopes, they give you dreams. You can't, you know, underestimate the power of your physical body, your five senses, the most important being the sixth one. All the things that you experience, they live inside your head, in your memory. You know, I mean, at night when you toss and turn and you can't sleep, it's because you keep imagining things. You know, you keep kind of rewinding the tape, looking at it again. And so... You know, at a certain point, you kind of come to realize all the relationships that you've made. You know, uh, it's not like you fall in love with love. It doesn't work that way. You fall in love by looking at someone. And then love disappears. It's you and this other body now creating narratives. It becomes about sofa, it becomes about toasters, it becomes about whether you want to live in Piedmont or Montclair, you know, but it becomes all about things, you know, and now your question is, well, how do I die to the things and go to what started all of this, which is love? I want to die with all the steps that lead to love. I just want to get rid of them and just be in love itself, you know. You know, we are not as fortunate as a salmon fish. But the salmon at a certain point says, the hell with this. It's just not working out for me. And it's not even reflectively. It, it happens instinctually. And at a certain point in a salmon's life, you know, it just climbs, you know, up this river. Some survive, others don't. Uh, they get to the top of the river they lay eggs and they die. You know. You know, I'm not like a caterpillar that can die to all my caterpillar experiences and all of a sudden go into a cocoon and turn myself into a butterfly and start flying around. It doesn't work for me that way. I wish it did, but it doesn't. It is such a horrific experience and a journey you know, I think whenever you want to change some very core parts of your life, which basically means if you want to change some very core parts of yourself, you have to overcome 20, 30 years of addiction. You know, and there are two ways you can do it. You can either do so much drugs where you get sick, where your heart gives and you just die. That's one way where you physically just die and the addiction is over. The other is you say, okay, I just 
don't want to do this anymore. But you look at your contacts in your cell phone, and these are friends with whom you've been drinking and smoking for the past 30 years. Everywhere you go in Oakland, you know, you have a story in this shop with that friend, in the other shop with this other friend. We have memories everywhere. You know, and so your question is, well, how do you change? How do you change into a butterfly before you're dead? Because if you don't change, then first, ref and when you don't change, but you do want to change, but you can't, reflection burdens you, first of all. It wears you out, day in and day out. It puts you in a bad mood. You're always angry. You get depressed. There is a great amount of loneliness. There are days you think you're just going mad, you know. I mean, you have to understand, you know, and I go back to what happened at the Oscars. You know, what you have is, despite fame, despite fortune, there is this part in us that remains so uncivilized so raw that nothing, nothing can be that powerful to always push it down. There are these moments where it comes out and within just a couple of seconds everything you have built in the past 30 years just goes up in flames. You know. So, you know, You know, if you go to the stages we talked about, how do you force someone? Because it is force. You know, you can't ask someone nicely, please keep your mouth shut. Yeah. Especially if they kind of just talk and talk and talk all the time, and that's what they've been doing. There's nothing wrong with that, you know. But if you go to a funeral, for example, kind of like... Camus' novel, uh, The Stranger, you know, where Mousseau is watching his mom being married, and he says, I like a cafe latte, and I like that girl over there whose name is Maria. Well, you don't do such things. You know, your mom is dead. So some, so some, show some remorse, maybe, you know, some shame, some grief. Maybe, maybe you can... Have some tears or something. Um, you know, how do you tell someone to kind of just be quiet? You know, because if you're talking about someone who's been addicted to just randomly just talking about things that really have no meaning and no depth, there are a couple of things you can do. You can either kick them out and never see them. Or you can kind of embarrass them. Or you can just patiently wait and wait and wait until they catch themselves. And make sure once they catch themselves, they don't lose what they have caught. Change is enormously difficult. You know... Um, You know, let me kind of the only way that you can slowly walk towards this concept dying before you're dead or overcoming addiction, you really need to be having some very, very, very profound and intense traumatic experiences. You know. You know, I had a, we had a customer at the car wash. She was a librarian in Roseville. She had been driving for 50 years. And I know something happens to you when you get older. But she just had a very minor, you know, 
um, accident. Someone just hit her bumper with her bicycle. It was a bicyclist. She couldn't drive for two years. The, you know, the, the experience was so traumatic for the 65, 66 year old woman that that particular experience overcame you know, her ability to drive. She had been driving for 60 years. That's what you need, you know. Um, there has to be a great amount of, I don't want to say hatred, it may be a little too strong, but you really need to kind of have come to a place of profound dislike for yourself and your position in life or you want to change, you know. And it has to be intense. It can be mild, it can be casual, it can be mediocre, you know. You can cook a turkey in the oven if the temperature is 250, you know, unless it's just there for like three weeks. And after that, you can't even eat it, it's gone bad.